The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hello everyone, I'm Deborah Hutchison in the Rogers TV studio and this is your local update. Well, as kids return to school, the automated speed enforcement cameras across Durham region are now operational. Joining us to uh, fill us in and tell us all the information that you need to know about it is Stephen Kemp. Stephen is the manager of traffic engineering and operations for the region of Durham. Stephen, welcome and thanks for taking the time to speak with us. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here and um, happy to uh, have you help us get the message out to uh, to our residents. Now, you've been warning of, that these cameras were coming now for quite a while. Um, now, some of them are operational. Let's back up a bit. Why was this initiative necessary? Yeah, so I can, uh, I'll start, uh, the story really starts back in, uh, back in April of last year when um, uh, Regional Council approved our uh, Strategic Road Safety Action Plan, uh, which we call uh, Durham Vision Zero. And uh, our Vision Zero plan is, uh, is, is about um, road user safety. And um, the, uh, the long-term vision is that, um, that everybody gets home at, at, at the end of the, end of the day. Um, zero fatalities and zero injuries on our, uh, on our road system is what we want and what we're striving for. Um, we realize that that's uh, maybe a bit of a, a longer-term aspirational type type uh, vision or target that we're working towards. So we have a shorter term goal, uh, which is a 10% reduction in uh, injuries and fatalities over the first five year period of our, of our plan. I know when we talk to police, um, you know, they say that when they reach out to the public and they ask about um, concerns, traffic is always really up there on the list and, and traffic safety. How did you go about choosing the locations for these cameras? Yeah, so the, uh, there's, there's a, a couple parts to that. So the first part about choosing the locations, um, part of it was really defined by the province when um, the province passed the legislation uh, allowing municipalities to use this equipment. Um, so uh, I think as most people know, um, the experience with um, automated speed enforcement or photo radar in the, in the mid 90s was not um, particularly well uh, received uh, provincially. And I think um, uh, the province was, um, the province really wanted to make sure that if they were going to allow municipalities to do this, that um, it was as transparent as possible and that it really focused on um, areas where uh, residents had specific concerns. So um, the province said that um, municipalities could use this equipment on their roadways only. So it's not being used on provincial um, roadways at all. So only allowed on municipal roads. And they went further to say that uh, it can only be used in uh, school zones and uh, community safety zones. So I think the basic premise of that was, um, uh, you know, hearing, listening to the public, um, I think generally people accept the fact that, that, uh, that speeding through a, through a school zone is just an unacceptable um, behavior that needs to, needs to change. And um, there's a lot more support, I think, for this type of technology in those in those areas than uh, on some, some other types of, of roads like highways, for example. So the province set those rules, which uh, limited um, the locations that we had to use the technology. And then the region went further and looked across our, our whole regional road network um, to look uh, where do we have school zones, where do we have community safety zones, uh, and then uh, try to prioritize those uh, those sites for implementation. So if you log online, I mean, you've made 
you made it very clear where they are going to be. I mean, the list is this long, but to start off with today, it's basically four regions, correct? Or four areas that we've got them operational. Yeah, that's true. So the way our program is uh, is going to work, we're, we're doing this as a, as a pilot project to, to test the technology and see, uh, measure what impact it actually has. Um, so to start, we, uh, we, we are working with four mobile automated speed cameras. Um, so these devices um, can move from uh, location to location. So we have four pieces of equipment uh, and we plan to rotate them through about 23 different, uh, different sites in the region. Uh, each camera will spend about one month at each, uh, each location. So you never know when it's going to move, right? So beware. Yeah, except we um, we don't intend to uh, surprise people with them. That's not uh, that's not our our objective. We are going to be very transparent about where they are and where where they are where they are going. All of that information is available on our um, on our website at durham.ca/ase. And uh, we're going to continue to update that and let people know uh, where the devices are, um, in addition to the signs that are in place at each location to tell you that there's a speed camera uh, ahead. So you, we don't we don't want to catch anybody off guard. You know, it'll be interesting to see once you move a camera, um, whether the complaints start again or whether, you know, whether people are not going to be as careful again. Um, let, let's talk about what happens if the camera catches you uh, speeding. There are fines, but no demerit points. How's that all going to work? Yeah, that's that's true. So um, there are there are uh, fines, but because this is a a, a vehicle based offense and not a driver based offense, um, there are no uh, demerit points associated with with the ticket. So if you get uh, pulled over for, for speeding by a police officer at the side of the road. Um, the uh, the fine gets issued to the um, the driver, and demerit points also get issued to the um, driver if if uh, if warranted. Um, the speed cameras have no information about who was driving the vehicle. Um, the cameras take a photo of the rear license plate of uh, of the speeding vehicle, so there's there's no information about uh, who is driving. The fine. Um, the fine gets mailed to the registered owner of of the vehicle, and because of that, no demerit points are are issued. So, um, in my case, I have uh, teenage sons that are both uh, driving age and often uh, borrow the family family car for for trips here and there. And uh, if if one of them um, gets a uh, automated speed enforcement camera ticket. Uh, driving through a school zone, that uh, that ticket will be mailed to me, and it'll be up to me and my uh, sons to negotiate how the uh, how the payment payment plan might work. And does the fine differ depending upon how quickly you are going, or how how much you're speeding over the limit? Yeah, the fine the fine does vary. The fine is exactly the same as the fine that you would pay if. Um, if you received a ticket from a police officer at, at the side of the road, it's the same section of the Highway Traffic Act that uh, that applies. Um, so the fines range at the very very lowest uh, uh, level to to uh, you know less less than fifty dollars at the at the low end, um, all the way up to closer to a thousand dollars at the very high end. I would think though, if you were Speeding at a rate where you would warrant a thousand dollar ticket, would, would police not be called in to talk to you? So, because we don't have any information about the driver, that's uh, that's a bit of a uh, bit of a challenge. So, um, when um, when you're when you're um, when you're pulled over at the side of the road, it's pretty clear who is driving the car. Uh, with a speed camera, that is less uh, less obvious. So um, we do have plans in place to deal with um, uh, any uh, 50 over uh, offenses because it is um, it is treated a little bit differently in the uh, 
uh, in the Highway Traffic Act. If, 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 you're, if you're caught by uh, a police officer on the side of the road at those speeds, you can lose your car for, for a few days and uh, really, really hefty fines. Um, a, a speed camera can't um, uh, uh, impound somebody's, somebody's vehicle at the, at the side of the road. So we're working through some different processes with, with the police to manage those types of situations. And I also have to ask you about, you know, usually when a police officer is pulling you over for, for speeding, you know, an officer has discretion, um, you know, a couple of kilometers over, they won't usually give you uh, a ticket. Is this a, a hard and fast rule? Like even if you're going one kilometer over uh, the limit, you're going to get a fine. Yeah, so we, we, uh, we're not disclosing to the public any information about um, about specific thresholds um, similar to how the police don't um, don't publicly talk about what those what those thresholds uh, are um, what i can say though is that the technology itself um, a, a, a camera a, a computer in a in a box has no um, human ability to be um, uh, to, to, to make make exceptions so it's programmed to work uh, uh, a certain way, and that image is uh, is automatically uh, captured. knows It knows nothing about um, the type of vehicle, who's in the vehicle, any other circumstances. It's it's uh, very very black and white. Um, what happens though is that uh, that image gets uh, recorded digitally, uh, and it gets sent to the Joint Processing Center, which is a facility in the City of Toronto that. Um, is processing all of the automated speed enforcement tickets um, issued in the province of Ontario. And uh, a provincial offenses officer that works in that facility reviews the image and reviews the, uh, the evidence that's collected by the camera. And that officer makes a decision on whether or not to lay a charge uh, based on the evidence that they have in front of them. Hmm. We've only got a, about another minute and a half. So I want to ask you though, if um, you know, a, a ticket or a fine is, is issued um, and the owner of a car doesn't pay, what happens then? Yeah, so um, the ticket arrives in the mail. Um, just like any other uh, a speeding ticket, you have, uh, um, you have uh, three options. Um, you can pay the, pay the, uh, the fine outright. Um, you can request a uh, meeting with a, a prosecutor at the at the courts to discuss uh, your case, um, or you can request a trial. Um, if uh, you 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 have to choose one of those those three options, um, if you if you just flat out don't pay, um, the regular repercussions would would apply. Um, you know. Go, when it comes time to go renew your driver's license, there would be outstanding charges on your uh, on your account, and um, it would um, it would be problematic for people. So we encourage people to to um, to pay or go through the other options that they have available to them. Okay. So once again, Stephen Kemp is with the uh, region of Durham. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Durham.ca slash ASE for uh, information on the uh, automated speed enforcement. Stephen, thanks again for joining us. You're welcome. Okay, stay with us. More to come on Local Update after the break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Being stuck in your home during this pandemic also means you have a home. Waiting in line for groceries means you have money for groceries. The isolation, being broke and totally scared about what's next. I was feeling that before this crisis. People say we're in this together, but me, 
I've got no one. Youth who have aged out of the child welfare system are in danger of falling further through the cracks because of today's crisis. They need your support. Please give today at helpyouthnow.ca. And welcome back to Local Update. September is Hunger Action Month. Feed the Need in Durham sending out a call to action to help battle food insecurity across the region. Joining us now is Ben Earle, Executive Director of Feed the Need in Durham. Welcome back to the show, Ben. Thanks, Deb. Nice to be here. Uh, so according to your stats, 60, over 66,000 Durham residents are what you call food insecure. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so these are individual, this is measured um, through the Ontario Health Survey uh, and published by the Region of Durham Health Department. And these are individuals who at some point uh, in the last 12 month period from when the survey is done have indicated that they have either had not had enough food at all or have had not had enough nutritious food uh, to meet their dietary needs uh, in the community. So there's a lot of people in our community who meet that criteria and then struggle to, um, if not put food on the table, put healthy food on the table at the very least. So we're not talking boxes and boxes of macaroni and cheese. We're talking, yeah. you know, the ability to afford meat and vegetables yeah. of of any kind. Yeah, we're, yeah, it, yeah. We're talking not just about you know people who have nothing, but people who also don't have access to those types of foods that can create a balanced, healthy diet that we all need. Especially, I would think in in times of COVID nineteen, um, you know. How much has the pandemic played upon the, that stat and I would think an increase in number? Yeah, we have seen an increase in people who are looking for emergency food support and that's our, that's our indicator that we use. Um, and those are individuals who lost work. Um, we know uh, at one point up to 3 million people had been put out of work um, across the country so, and that it definitely impacted our community locally. Uh, and we saw a rise in people act needing to access emergency food support uh, for exactly those reasons. They just did not have uh, the means to, to make everything meet at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the month, and uh, needed to seek out support. Um, and we've seen uh, that, that affect a few ways. One, people's access to food just by sheer not being able to afford it, but also, uh, especially in the, the beginning of COVID, people not being able to leave um, to get out to access food that they would normally have access to whether it's going to a grocery store or a meal program, um, or even um, in the case of seniors, accessing meals through senior centers and other places. Uh, and kids, in the case of kids, a lot of families rely on breakfast uh, and snack programs to supplement the meals that they give their kids. And those things all stopped um, in March. And a lot of families have, and individuals have been struggling since. And even if you could get out, you couldn't find things yeah. i remember one day in march going yeah. down the pasta aisle at walmart yeah and you know there was one bag of pasta left yeah and that was one of the problems we had uh, thankfully it looks like our supply chain has rebounded uh, quite a bit um, we do work with lots of food distributors and they've done great work to get those things back up and running um, but yeah especially the things that were were cheap and easy to afford that form a staple of a diet like things like rice and and pasta and pasta sauce the things that you need to get a to start your 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 meal planning, uh, we're not in on shelves, and that created some problems for a lot of people in our community. And I would think a lot of people had to make that incredibly tough decision: Do you feed your belly, or do you secure the roof over your head? Yeah, we know of a lot of people in our network who had to make those decisions. Um, individuals that we serve. Um, that were already living very precariously. Um, maybe they had part-time work or weren't working, uh, maybe living off social assistance or pensions or things like that, uh, who had to make those tough decisions when, um, uh, when, when the time came. Um, we know of a few people who've had to move a few times since March uh, that we've served through our network. Uh, not everyone, thankfully. There's been, we've had some good response. I mean, programs like the, the CERB help keep a lot of people uh, in their homes. Uh, and help make sure that they had at least something coming in. Um, but that wasn't everybody. Uh, and we also know that, that those programs are not set to remain. So we're thinking about what's next for us as well in our, in our organization and our network. What, how, how much of an increase would you say that you've seen in the demand mm -hmm. for what you're able to provide? 
Well, overall, we've seen about a 13% increase since March. Um, at the beginning, that was higher. Uh, you know, we saw an immediate run on on demand, uh, which was very similar to people, you know, making a run on grocery stores and stuff. People were, weren't sure how food was going to be secured. So there was a lot of early demand really high. But overall, since March, we've had about a 13% increase in the demand for food banks um, across Durham region. Um, and now the, the most telling part of that, though, is there's a 50% increase in the number of new people accessing food banks. Um, so that's uh, right. So out of the people who've never accessed a food bank before, um, we've seen about a 50% increase in that number since March. Um, so it's a lot of new people also looking for emergency food support for the first time in our community. And are a lot of these seniors or are they um, primarily, you know, families with young children or a real cross section? The lucky thing is, um, for, in our community, is we do support we we do support seniors fairly well. That's not to say that seniors aren't facing a need and that we shouldn't be making sure that they get the supports they need. Um, but from a food security point of view, most of the, the, the issues for seniors was access and getting out. And we saw an amazing response from so many community groups like the Caremongers uh, and others um, who, to make sure that our seniors in our community had access to food, whether they could get out to a grocery store or afford it. Or not. So there's been some amazing work done to support seniors. In our network, we've it's been largely mostly young families. Um, individ, like I said, individuals who maybe their kids uh, kids access at least one meal a day at school, um, and now they're home. Um, parents can't work um, because or because they've got to worry about their kids being home and things like that. So we've seen in our network at least it's been largely young families uh, and single people. Um, who weren't able to work, didn't have paychecks coming in, uh, didn't have those supplemental meals that they usually had access to. Um, so it's been across the board in the community, but in our network, it's been largely those, those younger families. Okay, so September is Hunger Action Month. Uh, what are you asking the community to do mm -hmm. and how do you uh, want them to respond? Yeah, so Hunger Action Month is our international campaign. Um, we're a part of it, we want to promote it locally. Uh, the goal is to recognize not only uh, that hunger is an issue for our community, um, but also to recognize the community supports that we do have year round um, and ask our community to step in and help us respond to hunger. Um, so we're, we've got a few advocacy things planned this month, um, messaging about what's been going on with COVID. Uh, we have our push uh, against hunger, which we'll talk about a, a little bit more in a minute. Uh, and we also... Um, uh, we also are doing a lot of work to recognize, especially our volunteers who've been so amazing to help us um, keep going. Uh, Feed the Need hasn't stopped, and our network hasn't stopped since COVID. A lot of charities and organizations slowed down, and we haven't. So we're using this month to recognize all of that. Our community can get involved. Uh, if you follow us, um, go to feedtheneedinderm.ca. You can see everything that we're doing on our website. Um, we're asking our community, if they can, to uh, make donations. Um, of either food or our cash uh, donations. Um, we, in order to, to, the safest way to do it these days is to make a, a financial donation um, because we can, you can do that online. You don't have to worry about coming to our facility or any of that. But if you do want to come to our facility and you do uh, want to donate food, which we always appreciate, um, we've got all the safety protocols in place. Uh, we just ask that people reach out to us in advance to let us know uh, so that we can make sure that we uh, are able to receive you safely and protect you and uh, and our volunteers and our staff uh, from any uh, from any possible transmission. Um, obviously, uh, please but we're asking everyone to please follow the guidelines they would follow if they're going to any store or grocery store um, or any other place to donate food. Uh, but yeah, you can find all of this information on feedtheneedinterm.ca. Uh, we appreciate all contributions uh, at this time, uh, either whether financial or food, uh, because we're going to need them uh, as we go forward. And financial donations, you have real buying power to get more bang yes. for your buck, so to speak, don't you? Yes, we can. Well, one, we can purchase in volume that uh, that allows us to reduce the cost of each individual product. Uh, that's one thing. But it, because we are a distribution network and we are a food hub, uh, we can leverage every dollar donated to distribute seven dollars worth of food to the community. Um, so that's not just purchasing; that's part of it. But it's also our ability to get more food out uh, to more people who need it. Um, and we do that because we are a collective impact network in our community of 60, over 60 organizations. Um, and we, we can do everything in such volume that it allows us to be extremely efficient. Um, so your dollar contributed uh, helps us get out a lot more food to people who need it. 
um, than you could purchase on your own. Now, September 22nd is Push Against mm -hmm. Hunger. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is our annual event where we walk from, uh, well, basically from Oshawa to Whitby. Uh, we will usually walk from uh, Oshawa City Hall. We walk all the way up to uh, the regional Durham headquarters in Whitby. Uh, the route has changed a little bit this year, but it's still the same walk. Um, and we do this to raise awareness, um, to um, engage the support of our, of, our, of our local government and our political partners. Uh, we always have mayors and, and elected officials uh, join us on this walk and uh, who are amazing supporters of us year round. Uh, and we just, we, we take that walk and we, we walk across the community to raise awareness for what we do, um, to engage our community that often the businesses along the way are supporters of us. So we make sure we make stops and recognize the support they've given us year round. And it's just a really, it's actually a fun way for us to get out um, and show our community that we're here and show, and show thanks to our community for the great support we get year round. And it's also a way for people to engage and, and show their support for our mission, uh, which is to respond to hunger in our community. And you know, Durham region communities across the board, they have really answered your mm -hmm. call, even though it is yes. challenging times. Yes, we can't, we can't thank our community enough. Feed the need, and I, I know a lot of charitable groups that we work with and that we, we love and, and are, are hugely supportive of. Uh, at our organization are, are struggling because they had to close and, and couldn't do their work to the full capacity that they just really want to do. Feed the Need in Durham has not been in that position. Uh, one, we were needed, but two, our community stepped up and has made sure that we've been able to keep doing what we do through food donations and, and financial support. Um, Feed the Need has been able to continue its mission and will be able to continue its mission because of our fantastic community support. And that starts with our local municipalities um, our, our mayors, our, our elected uh, councillors, and all the staff from the local municipalities really have shown a lot of leadership um, in helping us do our job um, and are hugely supportive. And they, through Hunger Action Month, they're doing, uh, and through the push, they are uh, once again sort of raising food on our behalf and, uh, and, and really getting their whole staff involved and the whole councils involved to show support for not just for Feed the Need, but for our community um, who may be, and especially those who may be struggling. So we can't thank our community enough for, for the, the way they've stepped up um, to support each other uh, through us at this time. Now, we only have about a minute and a half left. I, I want to uh, look into your crystal ball and talk mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, your next steps. Um, yeah. You know, we, we could be into a, a second wave. Numbers are mm -hmm. going up. Um, what are your next steps and how are you planning for the future? Well, our... We're, our biggest worry, one, is a second wave, and two, we know that a lot of the the economic impacts on families and individuals, uh, we're going to start seeing those more um, in the in the coming months. As the reality of people not returning to work sets in, as, as pr current programs start to end, uh, we're going to start to see the real economic impact. So that's what we're planning for and have been planning for. Um, we've been investing in our infrastructure local, uh, in the organization, increasing our, our truck and, and transportation capacity. We're also in, in the process of increasing our storage capacity, especially refrigeration, so that we can be ready to collect and, and have that food um, ready for our community when they need it and ready for the increasing and, and ongoing demand uh, for it. So we're really focused on making sure that Feed the Need has the food on its shelves and in its warehouse um, to get to people when they need it and at the time they need it and really working with our network of 60 organizations to make sure that they're ready uh, to meet any demand, no matter what it is, whether it's a, a huge spike in demand or it's just an ongoing chronic demand. Uh, okay. We're ready and we're building the processes to do that. Ben, um, I've got to yeah, stop you there. We're out, of, we're out of yep. time. Thanks so much for joining no us. We'll have to have you back. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Until Thank next you. time, I'm Deborah Hutchison. Perfect. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. There are soldiers in my family. I first joined the Legion to honor their service. Now I volunteer there to be of service myself. 